Martino passed away uh, a couple of years ago, and you and I, Pat, did a Remembering Bruno San Martino podcast. So we have talked at great length about good old Bruno, and I remember him being like one of your favorites. You talked. I didn't have to talk on that podcast. I did because I was hosting it, but I, I just kind of went, Pat, Bruno, and it, you're still going, actually. There's a time dilation <laughs> where you're still regaling us with tales of Bruno San Martino. Bruno was the king of New York for like eight years. Talk about that. He was the king of New York for two decades. <laughs> he was king of New York throughout the, the 1960s into the 70s, basically. Right. Um, the 60s were really his heyday. That was really Bruno's prime. That 1963 to 71 title reign is, you know, mm -hmm. the stuff of legend. Um, in the 70s, when Bruno wanted to wind his career down, essentially, and not work as much because he had made his money, he had his family, and he was kind of just tired of the grind, which is normal. Right. But, you know, he was so synonymous with those New York audiences wanting him and needing him on top that even guys who could draw well, Pedro Morales was a good draw in New York, large Puerto Rican audience. But the numbers dipped from all the other major arenas in that territory without Bruno on top. They brought Bruno in to give Pedro the rub. And they, in one of the big events of the 70s, sold out Shea Stadium in the first ever showdown at Shea Card in 1973. They wrestled 90 minutes in the rain to a curfew draw. Um, you could not get away with that now. I, I, I absolutely say that not. Say that again with all those, the, with all those details and variables. Because you know, I want an, people to 90, understand you can't do this now. A 90-minute curfew draw. And I say 90 minutes because I believe that was what they would maximize the match for. I believe it went 73 minutes in total. Mm -hmm. Two baby faces, just scientific holds, no rough, like no rough and rough housing or anything. But the crowd stayed through the rain and they called it a curfew draw. He does the same, you know, eventually they coerce him into taking the championship back. How many guys do you have to beg, please be my champion? Please, please be on top again. And they're not interested. Bruno initially agreed to be the champion again for a year. In 1973, at the end of 73, where he would beat Stan Stasiak to start his second reign as champion. What was supposed to be a one-year reign with Bruno only working major arenas turned into a, a near four-year reign with Bruno work, working very regularly in all of the, the, the major arenas and a couple of side, you know, B-level arenas on top of that. But it also included him, again, selling Shea Stadium out against Stan Hansen just a couple months after he had suffered a broken neck, uh, you know, being Kurt Angle before there was Kurt Angle kind of in that respect. Uh, also another Pittsburgh native, but, uh, and again, against Stan Hansen in a big revenge match, it was the only, you know, it was, it was the feature live bout for the Ali and Noki debacle. And it was the only arena that made money because everywhere else lost money on that show. Bruno, Bruno was synonymous with wrestling in New York, but Bruno was synonymous with wrestling for a lot of people across the country. That's what I wanted to was, ask Gavin about. He was the regular poster guy on the magazines. Mm -hmm. uh, if there were 10 wrestling magazines released because they were based in New York largely, but still Bruno was on the cover of probably six out of the 10 and I being the time. New York guy, mm -hmm. you know, he had private audiences with the Pope with his family. I mean, he's mixing it up with sports icons like Eddie Jockerman from the Rangers, Joe Frazier at the Dapper Dan dinners at Madison Square Garden. He's in the Madison Square Garden Hall of Fame. And, it, you know, this was when Madison Square Garden was the preeminent arena in the world for anything. Right. So for him to have been the biggest draw there through two decades, it, it's it's very hard to not find that guy to be the man in at least in that area, if nothing else. Gavin, you know, you grew up in the Rust Belt of uh, West Virginia. You talked about being a fan of everything like but the WF wrestling for you was west west south and west of new york so how did you come to bruno kind of like pat said he was a mainstay in the magazines um and so even guys that i didn't get to see wrestle i, I was familiar with who they were uh, largely through the bill after family of magazines and i knew who bruno was i uh, certainly knew what he looked like through the pictures and the posters and so on but I never really got to see Bruno work until his less than memorable appearances in the mid eighties when he was trying to help his son, David make some headway in the business. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was kind of underwhelmed, but even then I understood, well, this is a guy that was at his best 10, 12 years ago. Right. Um, and, and the so, funny part, the funny part of those matches, too, is you go back and watch him, and he, maybe he's working the honky-tonk man. 
he's not doing a ton. He's throwing punches. He's throwing the jumping kick, you know. But the crowd still eats up. <laughs> sure. It's crazy. I, I remember when we talked about, was it WrestleMania, Pat, or yeah. WrestleMania 2, where, you know, they threw him out there for a cup of coffee, and he was the most over guy in the match. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because he was still Bruno. Yeah. And, you know, even, even only knowing him through the magazines, I knew it was a big deal when Bruno was there. Even if he wasn't at his best, even if, if this wasn't the guy that was champion for years and years and years, I knew it was still a big deal because it was Bruno. Right. Um, I yeah, I know of Bruno just because Pat and I talked about it, but also because I, I grew up in New York and I grew up with the WWF, and he was he was Hogan before Hogan was Hogan, so hey, you, you couldn't get away from him. Um, Bruno was one of those guys who, like, you talk about wrestling today, and you know, and people who don't watch the first stupid thing they say is, "Oh, that's that's the fake stuff where they, you know, there's a dead guy and there's the zombies and yeah, you know, all kinds of stupid shit." Um, but Bruno, you know, Bruno comes from a time where um, first make it look real, and he was probably one of the best at that. Ask the orangutan if it's fake. 